Hi. We're uh Happy we're Thursday. Our seasonal lighting. Yes. The seasonal lighting. Our seasonal lighting. We did about five minutes of decorating <laughs> this weekend. We pulled out the um the box and the um yeah, I think we did we did lights in here, which I really like because I hate the darkness. We did lights out there. Colored lights outside. Yes, colored lights outside. And then my Grinches. Oh yeah, your Grinches. And the tree. So we're um yeah, I think we get a, a C for holiday decoration, but better than but last year. Up. Yes. Yeah. Last year, he went to Argentina. I stayed here. It rained the entire time. Our house flooded, and our groom quit. That yeah. was last year. Argentina, it's summertime, so I was at the beach, at the pool. <laughs> I enjoyed 10 days of holiday in the summer, and here it was raining nonstop, and the groom left. Which groom was that? Jose. Our groom now is named Jose, too. But see, that's the problem with, like, when you have horses, you can't go on vacation. You can't leave. It's very hard. Oh, look, Mindy's here. Mindy says hi. Hi, Mindy. Okay, so tonight we actually have a lot of questions to answer. I was getting a little worried that we didn't have any questions. Also, be sure to check out the links either above or below. I do have a little holiday season sale going on. So there's some swag for sale. There's um, a holiday bundle, which includes top line, engaging the hind end, and half halts. So check that out. And I'm doing a bunch of webinars. So on January 1st, mark your calendars, New Year's Day, I'm doing a webinar on goal setting. And then the following Sunday, January 8th, I'm doing a webinar on groundwork. So be sure to RSVP. Those links are above and below. Um, okay, so I wanted to start out tonight's talk on not like a good note, on kind of a sad note. So I think one thing that we were talking about today is how to handle kind of disappointment or what to do if your horse gets lame or passes away or you have to retire your horse. So um, what are your tips for that? Uh, well, I had to put... Um nuku down he had colicked and he had colicked a lot and then we had some uh, we changed the feet up the forker was great and he went about 18 months and he didn't have anything and uh, things were going along uh we were schooling the grand prix i'd shown the i2 in december and then january 30 went to the hospital and a few years back and then january 4th i had to put him down and uh it was just devastating to have all my my horse died. My dreams die. It was just a bad, bad day. And, um, and I, yeah, I, I've got to talk myself into a better mind state. And, uh, and what I told myself was that the, the reason that the lows are so low with the horses is because the highs are so high. You know, I don't enjoy anything really. And I do a lot of things and I don't really enjoy anything as much as I do as my horses. And so, the highs are so high because the lows are so low, and um, that's just the game. That's the game we play. And if I want yeah. the highs, i got to have the lows, and that's what I tell myself. And yeah. That's how I dealt with it. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. And I think it's important mm -hmm. to just, like, never take it for granted, you know? And, and we all do that. I do that sometimes, that you don't realize that every day that you have your horse and that you get to ride your horse – is a blessing and i think it's also you learn so much so like even though you don't have q anymore you learn so much from him and you can bring yeah. that along and and those memories are precious of the horse and and that's hard with horses is like you're gonna outlive them it's the same thing with levi i say all the time i'm like when levi dies we're going to be heartbroken like we are going to be so sad but it's not today it's not today <laughs> not today and we had a client that had bad news with her horse and that's why yeah. it would, it's on our mind at the present yeah. yeah but it's heartbreaking you know you take years and years to build a partnership with a horse and and then all of a sudden that just can end and it's really it's really sad and it's important to you know to be there for people when they're going through that because it's definitely it's a really hard time and um so try to remember the good times and 
everything that you learned from your horse and move on. And yeah, this happens too. Um, as your skill set improves uh, and some horses are limited, yeah, you do. You outgrow your horse and uh, you, you want to find it another person that it can come up and bring along. And that goes to an earlier question that we got about somebody wanted to just get an into dressage and, you know, how to start. Find an easy horse to ride. Find it, yes. It's I... really the rideability and now, all right, I'm just going to say it. Don't let anybody talk to you into this is a dressage horse. It has these terrific gates and, you know, you have to have this to be competitive and you find a horse you can ride. Don't buy the horse that you're going to ride next year. Don't buy the horse that your trainer can ride for you right now. Buy yourself a horse that you can ride today because if you yeah. cannot ride it today, you can't ride it. Yeah. No, and that way you can yeah. enjoy the journey. And yeah, you do. You end up outgrowing that horse. Yeah. But it, it's a way easier way to go. Yeah. But it's so important. And I know like we all want these beautiful horses with these beautiful gates. But the reality of it is that you don't get to start out with that. You don't get to start out with huge gates and the most beautiful horse. You need to start out with a simple horse that you can ride and that you can learn on because the bigger the gates, like the more exponentially difficult the horse is to ride. And that's really, really important to, um, to remember. Yeah. So does everybody read these comments or they just, uh, yeah, everyone uh, can uh, see uh, so everyone. We see the comments we're on, we're live on Facebook and on YouTube. So we are seeing like all the comments. We can't always see your names, which is too bad. But we do see all of the comments. So. Right, because somebody said that happened to them there. Yeah. And okay, we're going to start with the questions. Um, Gail, in your experience, what are the best exercises that gradually help a horse come back from hawk injections? It is my first experience with such, and I don't want to be too eager. Um, that's a good question. We actually had a horse get their hawks done today. So usually with hawk injections, they need like a full week off. It Listen to your vet. Every vet says a little different. Usually we do three days of walking, three days of light work, but it shouldn't be like um, injecting the hawks. It's not like an injury really. It's just like they might be sore from it. So it shouldn't, you should be able to be back to full work in, in a, a week. week. Yeah. yeah. Okay, this next question, I, I, I read it and I, I'm going to be very nice. So I've been riding my nine months now. I've got an independent seat. I've got throughness and moments of the horse being round. This fiery mare loves to extend but needs a lot of leg for collection. Any t tips on keeping energy but collecting in canter and trot? Okay, I'm going to tell you that if you've been riding for nine months, you do not have an independent seat and your horse is not through. That's maybe not the nicest answer, but like I've been riding for whatever, 15 years, and I'm still working on my independent seat. It's not something that you're never done working on your seat and your horse is never completely through. It's, it's like a lifelong journey. Do you agree? Yeah, and I remember yeah. I remember when I first started to ride, well, no, I played with it. It's, when I first started taking like serious lessons, I got lunged every, for five days a week. I got lunged, no stirrups, no reins for 20 minutes every day. And that went on for six months. And then they gave me reins to hold. Yeah. And then I still, and I couldn't steer. Yeah. I remember that painfully well. Yeah. So you've got a fantastic horse, though, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and whoever is starting to learn how to ride, you should get that horse because that horse is giving you a great feeling. And so, yeah, you probably get out in front of that horse's stall and thank every day that you get to ride that horse. Yeah. And uh, but anyway, to answer your question seriously, time and miles, you've got to develop feels. Keep riding that horse and you'll feel more as you go. Yeah. Yeah. And then as far as keeping energy in the collection, a lot of transitions like so it's important to remember that collection isn't about slowing down. It's about rebalancing your horse. So you need to get the hind end to lower and you want shorter and higher steps. And so you get that by like 
the rubber band exercise where you collect, go, collect, go, collect, go, collect, go. And you should not have to put more leg on for collection. It's really important that you can take your legs away and keep that activity and keep the activity because if you have to kick for it, then they're not in front of your leg anymore. Okay. Next question is from Callie. I'm excited for your goal setting webinar. Can you explain how your webinars work? Do we sign up? And then are they aired on YouTube? Okay. So my goal setting webinar, which is January 1st is going to be on zoom. And so that is why you need to RSVP. The links are above or below this video. I'm doing a goal setting webinar on the first, a groundwork webinar on the eighth. There will be a worksheet for the goal setting webinar. I've been reading up on goals and you're like 10 times more likely to achieve your goal if you write it down and if you divide it up. So I'm excited for goals. Another thing that I read about, which is Aristotle. He's like, what, like a really old philosopher, mm -hmm. right? And he talked a lot about goals and that it's basically a human need to be striving towards something, like to be working towards getting better at something. That's an innate human need. And I think that that explains why we do dressage when it's so hard, right? Yeah, I mean, I love that part of it. I love the, the chess game of it. Yeah. You know, trying to figure it out, what works with this horse and how much and how little. And it was very satisfying that. Yeah. But don't you say all the time, you say, what's your saying about? You said if it's easy, everyone would be doing it. And doing it well. <laughs> if it was easy, everybody would do it and do it well. We'd all be at the Olympics. Yeah. But, you know, yeah, that's what I say all the time. If it was easy, we'd all do it and do it well. And yeah. that's just not, this is not the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. So the goal setting webinar is going to be very fun. And yes, there will be a replay if you're not able to attend it live. But I really encourage you guys all, like, this is a good time. It's winter. It's a good time to kind of reflect and then set some intentions and make a plan for the year ahead. So that's what I'm planning on doing. And then there's there's my type of comedy there with the masochism. Yes, because that's the greatest thing about dressage. You can do it all the time and still suck, you know. And it's not like another sport. Like if you played football or tennis or something, you'd age out and hurt yourself and not be able to play anymore. But with dressage, you can suck for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And <clears throat> if, I mean, it's so true sometimes, like, I think the more you know, the more you realize you, you don't, don't know. know. Because if you like, if you say like, oh, I've got it all figured out, or I have an independent seat, or my horse is through, or my horse is supple, then like you don't really know what you're talking about. Because it's like all these things that we want, it's like you're never, your horse is never trained. It's not like I have a Grand Prix horse. It's trained. It's not like it's not like your computer where the software is downloaded into your Running. computer you have to constantly refine that communication with your horse and either you're training or you're untraining you never get to just it's not like it doesn't count <clears throat> yeah i'm gonna try and suck tomorrow just a little bit less than i sucked today that's that's my goal <sighs> okay um how do you introduce haunches into a green horse Question from Cassidy. Um, shoulder in, 10 meter circle haunches in. If that isn't working, um, I'll do counter shoulder in and then try and change the bend. Yeah, I like that. You do like leg yield with a head to the wall and or counter shoulder bend. in. Yeah. Because I think sometimes with horses at first, it's really hard to get the haunches to actually come off the rail. Like they don't understand. They're like, why would we do that? Um, so I think leg yield to, with the head to the wall is a and good then slowly change the bend and, you know, and just yeah. feel your way. That's so easy. And you, and you just kind of feel your way into the new bend that you want. You start in here and then you kind of, Oh, that's or as far as I can pokey. go. Oh, I can use pokey. So you're going to go <laughs> head of the wall, leg yield, and then you start to try and change the bend and maybe you can get to there or maybe you could actually get to there yeah but you feel it and you just work on it every day and get it over a little bit more obedient yeah 
But that's the hard part about haunches in is that your horse actually has to bend in the body like this, which is hard to do. So, um, Okay, good. Next question is from Kathy. She Do they said, just post questions in the chat? Yeah, you can put questions in the chat. Um, we we always ask like the or a few hours beforehand for questions. So that way we have like a bank of questions to answer. We're not just making things up. Okay, Kathy says half halts are very confusing and elusive to me. You, me, and everybody yeah. else. Um <laughs> Yeah, because half halts are different. It, they require a lot of feel. They're different on every horse. They're different at every moment. No two half halts are created equal, and that's why they're so difficult. So, but for just, and this is right out of the German handbook. So if you took a heavy stone and you had a staircase in front of you, you have to lift that stone off the step and then place it on the step above without making any noise, right? you got to lightly set it down. So there's the tightening of your core, the lifting of the stone, and then, like everything, it's the giving. So you make that, you close your hands into a fist, you lift up that stone, and then you have to put it forward onto the step above. And that way, part of your half halt is the release. Yeah. That is the most basic thing, and just get that because that'll help rebalance your horse. It tightens your core, gets a horse under you, not spilling onto the forehand. And then part of the half oh, halt. They want the to see your hands. Okay. <laughs> Can we see me here? Right, slide off there. Oh, I'm getting expelled okay, so from the here, screen. Right? So you tighten yourself and then it's, it's like you lift this rock and then set it on the step. But your hands need to be this way. Yeah. I'm trying, I'm watching them in the camera. It's not helping. <laughs> so here and then the softening. So in here and then the softening. Does that work? Yeah. Yeah, she says that's good. <laughs> but it's um and yeah, it's subtle. I mean, it's not like you're trying to saw wood, right? I mean, yeah, but it's also important if you think about lifting up a stone, that requires a lot of energy, like in your right. body. Yeah. And same thing with you have a to horse. Lift that yeah. and then soften it. Like the horse needs half halts are actually about gathering the energy and rebalancing it's not about taking energy out or halting and so basically the definition of half halt is is about rebalancing and it's also about getting your horse's attention and focus which is a big part of it is like if your horse is staring off into the distance, a half halt can be like, hey, horse, like I'm right. up here. We're going to do something. And all of these so. things get the name half halt. And the easiest one is to think about the rebalance. Yeah. Yeah. You know, is your horse, think like if you took a glass of water and you turned it upside down, that water would spill out everywhere. The half halt gets the water back into the glass. Yeah. So, and also check out the link. I have a workshop on half halt. So you guys should check that out. Okay. Um, next question. Oh, Deborah, you have a nice photo of a horse in lunge gear. Maybe talk about how to lunge. Um, and there's also a question here about long lining. So yeah, I posted, see, that's a photo. I posted a little photo of me. I did some in-hand work with um, Luigi. He is my six-year-old. And I think that lunging and in-hand work is really useful. I'm going to be doing the Groundwork Masterclass in um, January. But with Luigi, I've been trying to teach him Piaf and Passage. And it's really, really helpful to do it from the ground. And so it's just a good tool to have to be able to do it on the ground. I think everything with groundwork, it it's important that you start simple because a lot of people always ask me about long lining and it's really important that you start with like basic ground manners and that you really get comfortable with your horse on the ground before you do long lining because long lining is really difficult and complicated and you can mess it up really easily. So um, there's definitely like- Mostly a, by getting the horse scared and having it run off. Yeah, with you. yeah flying like height that's not good right and horses too you know if you just like put tight side reins on them you can really panic them so it's really important that you follow the correct steps 
And also that you get really competent on the ground so that you know what to do when your horse does get scared or a little bit panicked. Um, I think that that's really, really important. Um, okay. Uh, here's a question. My horse is lazy and he just doesn't want to engage his hind end and back. What exercises can I do? Transitions. Transitions and sparky ones, like zero to 60 <laughs> right here, right now. Sparky. You, sparky. <laughs> I had a. You don't um, want to develop that medium trot. You want to go from zero to sixty in one stride. Yeah. And if he doesn't, encourage it vigorously forward. Yeah. Until that he knows that when you put your leg on, he's got to go. You put, yeah. It's just transitions, but not sixteen strides to something. It could be halt trot. It could whatever you know. Just yeah. Walk to trot, but it's got to jump off the ground. But one thing that's super important is that the upward transition has to be explosive, mm -hmm. but the downward transition needs to, to be, be gradual. So you want your horse to like explode forward, but then you don't want them to like do a Pump sliding the Yeah. So, and that's really kind of tricky on a lazy horse for sure. Um, okay. Next question is what to look for when purchasing a new horse for dressage we already answered that so watch the beginning of this how can i keep my horse relaxed but forward throughout the walk she falls into the trot toward the end of the free walk on the diagonal before i even start shortening my reins so the horse starts jigging when she in the free walk oh when she, she starts, yeah. Leg yield. yeah yeah so a little leg yield and you know, just feel that like right when your horse starts to jig that you push them just a little bit to the side. Okay, Sarah Beth, horses that want to be too light in the contact, specifically young horses, but all of them in general, why is this an issue and how to develop a more consistent contact with these soft mouth movers without getting talked into a looser rein by then? That's a good question. Yeah, because um, those light, yeah, because I've ridden a few horses. They just like to be ridden with a lighter feel, and I would like to have a couple more pounds, and I can't. They don't. So um, what I'm really acutely aware of on those horses is the tension that I keep in my, the tension that I keep in my reins, right? Because there's a very small margin. You know, horses that want to take a little bit, it's a little easier when they're so light like that. So my whole ride, I'm really kind of going, okay, do I have the lips? Do I have the lips? Do I have the lips? It's it, it, That moves more to my mind than is it in front of my leg. I mean, yes, I'm thinking about the forward and the hind legs and everything, but that my hands never disappear, that the horse can't find the spot to get behind a bit. And so it's, yeah, I'm always, you know, driving forward, but always thinking about that elastic feel. Yeah. And, and it's and really that teaches the horse then to hold the bit more. Yeah. Yeah. So like with a horse that tends to lean and get strong, you That's might, yeah, you might kind of vibrate, give like you're moving the bit a little more in their mouth with a horse that gets too light and hides, you've got to really work on keeping the bit really still in their mouth and like, Herman said, like, you're just kind of following it and keeping just a few ounces of pressure. Because if you let the rein go slack and then you take it and you hit the horse in the mouth, that's going to surprise them. Um, the other thing that we both use uh, on those horses is like a plastic oh, yeah, bit. The, bit. the happy mouth bit. The one I found that the one that's just straight across yeah. with no joints. Straight plastic is what I use yeah. on those horses that have trouble to the yeah to the bit. The, a lot of times, like young horses, if they're like chomping at the bit or they're just like really just like steady or something. Yeah. And then I also do groundwork. Like I teach them to go to the contact a little bit from the ground by doing some leg yields and some turn on the forehand. But that's me. I'm a groundwork fan. You're not, yes, you are. You're not so much. It's a lot of walking. <laughs> oh, God. It works, though. It does. Um, hey, I'm doing groundwork with Kensington. Oh, yeah. he's He's been doing a mirror therapy. Mirror, mirror therapy, yeah, mirror training, desensitizing Kensington to the mirror. Poor Kensington is, like, so afraid of his own 
his shadow. own shadow, his own reflection. And you were like, oh, I can fix it. And I'm like, great, go for it, go for it. Um, okay. Let's talk about, I'm trying to find another good question. Before we go eat dinner, what did you make us for dinner? Uh, squash and bell peppers and rice. Mm. It oh, smells so good. It too, and some seasoning, you know. <laughs> okay, here's a good question from Jennifer. When do you give up and admit that flying changes just aren't going to happen? Uh, I haven't. I don't. Okay, I, I'll tell you what. I think there's a, there's like a, if I think it depends a little bit on age of a horse. Yeah. I think that that's probably the biggest de defining thing. I'm guessing you didn't buy this horse as four years old and started. Yeah. So. Because the best time to teach the flying changes, I would say, is between five and a half and six. Seven, seven and a half yeah like that that's your window if you wait until they're in there like 11 12 the horse 15, is like i've never done this 20. why would i start now yeah so um i would say yeah if you have a horse that's like 20 you're not going to get flying changes to happen that's what i would say so when do you do it uh Right. If all those conditions are there, then you go, okay, I'm going to do flying changes on the next one. I mean, I don't know how old your horse is. I don't know how, what you've ridden and, and all those things. But at a certain age and a, and a certain amount of training, too, I mean, if the horse has never done a flying change and it's 10, yeah, it doesn't see the point now. But the thing about flying changes, I've been, I've been working on them a lot because I'm trying to put together a flying change course, which is going to be awesome. But it's all about the basics. So like if you try a change and it doesn't work, you have to go back to the basics and you have to work on your canter quality and you have to work on the canter walk canter transitions and you have to work on being able to collect and go forward. And so it's really important. I think people make the mistake when they're teaching the changes that they just start trying to work on the changes over and over and over again. And they don't go back to the basics and then they lose the canter quality. The horse gets on the forehand and tense and there's no way that the horse can do the flying change. So whether or not you can do a flying change is really um, a test of your basics and of your canter quality. And you have to keep going back to that. I say that it's, I was teaching a student and I came up with this. It's 80 percent basics and then only like 10 to 20 percent are you actually working on the flying changes and um and so also and we don't know really how you've gotten ready for this too i mean counter canter is important canter walk transitions are vital right and yeah. somebody put in there that the horses figured out how to put a half a trot step in and i've seen that with a lot oh, of horses yeah. where they go yeah oh, this is too much work and then they yeah. pat the ground once and then make the change um and those habits are hard to break once they have them too. So, yeah. you know, I mean, if you've done all your prerequisites, you have counter canter, you have canter walk, canter transitions, and those are all great. And then the horse is a little older and you're not getting it. It may not happen. Yeah. Yeah. I hate to say never, but it might, it might not. Okay. Here's a good question. So when executing a flying change from the half pass to the wall, as in fourth level test one, can you describe the aids of asking for the flying change, say at M? So coming from the right half pass, so you're going up the center line, half pass right. I think in fourth one, you go half pass right to B or E or whatever that letter and is. And you have to ride some counter canter. And then you and then counter the canter and then the change. So during the counter canter phase, right, you, you're in right lead canter, your right leg's at the girth, the left leg's slightly back, you bend this to the right. In that counter canter part, you're starting to change the flexion to the other side, and then you have to go right rein, right leg, but the horse is already looking left. left. And then you release the left rein as the right rein, right leg come back, and the left leg ends up at the girth. Yeah. <laughs> Did it's you like guys skipping. all follow that? Let me know if you followed that. That was a lot. But it's, um, so basically what's really important with the flying changes is, is that your leg position determines what lead. lead. So you need to be able to bend your horse the opposite way 
without them doing a flying change. And that is really hard, but also super, super important for the tempi changes. And also for your canter half pass zigzag is that the horse waits until you actually change your legs. And that's part of why they put that counter canter in that test is because they really want to make sure that your horse is on the aids and that it's not just the second you go to the rail that and the bounce horse off into right. the lead. That you have to be able to prepare the horse by changing the bend. Yeah. And then applying the aid. Yeah. <laughs> just like that. Those are your, those are your feet. <laughs> Yeah. And you do. It's like the, the, your leg has to switch quickly and at the right time and your horse has to hear it and everything has to happen in a millisecond. And that is the hard part of yeah, changing. The flying changes for me are the hardest thing we do because it's not yeah. like, you, oh, I need more of this. I'll ask for a little more. Yeah. It has to be all right, right now. Yeah. Okay. I think that's it. We're starving. I'm starving. I want to go have dinner. It has been a really long day. My assistant was sick today and I rode a lot of horses and it's winter and it's going to rain again this weekend. So I'm tired. I rode a lot of horses today. It's winter. Yes. Right. Um, it's good to talk to you guys and be sure to RSVP and mark your calendars for goal setting on January 1st, groundwork on January 8th. Are you going to come on the webinars? No, you don't come on the webinars. Those are on the weekends. It's just me. He doesn't work on the weekends. There might be lobster. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. Have a good evening.